Good morning, and welcome to our worship service. A couple of announcements before we begin. The chapel office will reopen this Friday, October 1st. Their office hours will be Monday through Friday, 9 to 12. We ask that if you want to meet with Gary or Nora, that you call and set up an appointment. Um, we will be following uh, the COVID guidelines of mass required and social distancing. Second, we are on target to go live with our new website on October 5th. We will be using the same URL as we do today, www.marinersandschapel.org. So if you're using our current website, there will be no change to how you access it. For those who are interested, we will be setting up Zoom sessions where our webmaster, Ken Slowick, will demo the new site and get everyone comfortable in navigating around the new menu items. More details on that will be in our Wednesday's e-blast. Mark your calendars for a fun afternoon, October 6th. The chapel is hosting a Mariner Sands scavenger hunt. All the details will be in tomorrow's Mariner Sands highlights and happenings, but the most important for you now is to contact Lisa Goodmaster and set up and reserve a spot for your uh, team of two. The fun will begin at 345, followed by a BYO social hour starting at five. And now for some of you who have been patiently waiting, the board met on Friday and approved the reopening plan for the sanctuary. Our first indoor and outdoor worship will be next Sunday, October 4th. You will be receiving a letter from our president, Darcy LeClaire, with the guidelines. A copy will also be posted on our bulletin boards. But in short summary, if you plan to worship inside, social distancing will be followed. You will need to wear your mask at all times. There will be no congregational singing, so no need to touch the hymnals. We ask that you print your own bulletins or view the service guide from your smartphone or device. Seating is limited and access will be on a first come first serve basis. I would also like to stress that this reopening plan is truly a work in progress. None of us have ever done this before. So what you experienced on October 4th may be slightly tweaked on October 11th and tweaked again on October 18th. The board welcomes all of your comments and your suggestions. Our number one priority is to provide a safe worship experience for all of you and for our employees. For those of you who wish to continue to worship in your golf carts, parking will be on the north side of the chapel. You will be able to view the service through the sliding doors and speakers will enable you to hear the service. And we understand as a result of the pandemic precautions, we are moving more even further away from paper and relying more on emails and internet. For those of you who are not on the internet or use a smartphone, our communications committee is set, setting up a phone tree to make sure you ke are kept informed. If you would like to be part of that phone tree, please contact the office and have your name added. And finally, for the last announcement, I am going to use a sports analogy. In the game of life, Mariner Sands Chapel is Team God, and we are in need of some bench strength, AKA volunteers. We need ushers, parking attendants, scripture readers, folks willing to learn how to operate our audio and visual equipment, just to name a few. I Google the top reasons or excuses people might give for not volunteering. I'm too busy. I don't need another commitment right now. And the one that I am going to take care of right now is I haven't been asked. I am asking all of you here, present, and those watching on video to say yes. Say yes, you will play for Team God. Because can you really say no to God?
Good morning and welcome everyone to our worship again. Thank you, Sandy, for those wonderful and clarifying announcements. Won't it be great to be inside next week? I'll trust that that's, that's an amen. Um, <laughs> join with me now in our call to worship. I, I'll read the fine print. You'll respond with a bold face print if you printed out your bulletin uh, or if you have it on your device. Trust in the Lord at all times, O oh people. God is a refuge for us. God is our rock and our salvation. We shall not be shaken. God is good. And in God's work, we find our strength. We sing of all God's wonderful works. We give thanks and praise to the Lord. Let's sing together now, Be Thou My Vision. It's number 359 in our hymnal, and you have the words before you. Just one verse. the peace and we will do it similarly to how we did it last week we look at one another and we say peace be with you and the other person says and also with you the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all I tried that with a young man a couple of weeks ago and he and he says, oh, let's do it this way. And so he would make his peace sign, peace of the Lord be with you. And then he would go like that. And I would go, woo, like that and catch it. And uh, so maybe we'll try that, but that'll require a little bit of practice. Anyway, uh, may God's peace be with you. Let us pray together this prayer of adoration. And then if you'll join me in that prayer of confession. Almighty God, again today, we thank you so much for this day, for this opportunity to worship you, to gather in your name, to seek your will, to hear your word afresh, and to hear it expounded on so that your Holy Spirit would encourage us to live holy lives. May all that we do today bring glory, bring adoration, be a fragrant aroma before your almighty throne, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we pray, we also want to lift up our time together, uh, take a time together rather to lift up our prayer of confession. That's where we agree with God that God is right, that sometimes we just don't live up to all those high ideals that God has called us to when we ask for forgiveness. So let us pray this prayer of confession together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord, amen. Our declaration of pardon is something that we will do together. I'll read the finer print, and if you'll respond in the people's print with a bold face there. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Let us sing the Gloria Patri. Yeah. 
Scripture morning this morning comes from the letter to Titus. This week it's chapter 3, verses 1 through 9 and verse 14. Hear the word of the Lord. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, and to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us gener generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things, so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. The word of the Lord, according to Titus. Let us sing this chorus, He is Lord. It's number 54 from our hymnal. Lord of this county, Lord of this city, and Lord of this Mariner Sands community, to you every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. Today, O oh mighty God, as we intercede for our neighbors, our friends, our countrymen, we pray, O oh God, that you would help give wisdom and insight to all those who are working on the solutions and the cure and the vaccine for this pandemic, both for the treatment as well as the vaccine. God, give these individuals who are working in the field of science and medicine such insight and wisdom that a cure, a treatment would be available soon, not only to us, but for the world. This is a plague, almighty God. And as we have seen throughout history, when plagues come, you bring healing and you bring repentance and you bring redemption. And so God, when people do experience all the healing and re return to normal, may they give praise to you, you who are the God of all healing. Lord God, we uh, want to intercede for those who are injured those who have uh, experienced illness, we pray, oh God, that they would find healing today. We pray for those who are needy, the hungry and the homeless. God, today would you provide for their daily needs and help them to sort out their life, to get their life on the right track. We pray for family members, both near and far, Sometimes, oh Lord God, our families are just so going through so much turmoil. We just want to intercede for our children, our sons, our daughters, our grandchildren. We pray, oh Lord God, that you would be close to them today and 
in those cases where a miracle is needed, O oh Lord God, work a miracle in their lives. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's sing together the great glory to God known as the doxology. chapter 18, verses 21 and 22. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this is the second message from Titus. And I want to begin with uh, a confession. In my mind, I imagine things to go perfectly. Whether it's taking a trip, cooking a meal, working out, and yes, even preaching a sermon. As Stephen Covey in his book, The Seven Habits, once remarked, I begin with the end in mind. And to me, the end looks perfect. In reality, though, it, it doesn't turn out that way. It doesn't for me, it probably doesn't for you either. Things appear perfect in the beginning, but then as you have to start working toward that perfection, you have to start working from wherever you are. And so now, if that task that we're working on is fairly easy, well, then the distance to achieving that goal isn't that long, and the results you imagine really aren't that difficult to achieve. But if the task is difficult, or even if it seems impossible, then, well, then you better buckle up. You better bring your best self to the table and plan on working late, plan on some overtime, plan on failing again and again, and plan on suffering, plan on having your emotions wrenched, and plan on sipping some tea with a coworker named Disappointment. You can start, you can also plan on running out of energy every week when you're trying a task that's so hard and so impossible. You can plan on running out of money at the end of the month. You can plan on running out of ideas every quarter. You can plan on running out of patience every year and running your faith to its very limits of belief. Now in the aviation world, there's a term for that kind of a life that's trying to achieve hard things through various difficulty. In the aviation community, it's a term we call pushing the envelope. It's what military pilots do when they fly their high performance aircraft whenever they go flying. They trust their aircraft and its avionics instruments to deliver maximum performance every time they fly. Now, why in the world would you ever sign up to fly a $65 million jet aircraft, and these pilots, uh, why would they fly at 200 knots at 15,000 feet, nice and straight level? No, what makes these aircraft and these pilots so unique is that they're flying at Mach 1.4. They're pulling eight Gs. They're, le they're ascending up to 49,999 feet because the aircraft is limited to 50,000 feet. They complete their mission, and then they descend to land on a pitching aircraft carrier deck at night in 15-foot seas 
with crosswinds, low fuel, and only 200 yards of runway just to hook one of four arresting gear wires that will shock their body from 160 miles an hour to zero in less than two seconds. And they'll do this again tomorrow. It sounds like a crazy life. And it is a little crazy. So crazy that the rest of life outside the cockpit for them seems a little boring. Now, if you've never had that kind of life, you've probably never approached the outer limits of human experience like they did. If you've never pushed the envelope, pushed your envelope, you may never not have ever realized what astonishing limits were created for you by God Almighty. One football coach remarked to his team during practice one hot summer day, a maximum performance, guys, demands a maximum me. And the motto of the U.S. Navy SEALs, do you remember that? The only easy day was yesterday. Now, on the flip side of this exciting life, this exciting philosophy of life, on the flip side is failure. There's always a risk of failing. The anguish of failing in big things is inexpressible. My son-in-law is a captain for an airline, and early on in his career, he remarked to me that there's no room for error as an airline pilot. If you overshoot an icy slick runway in low visibility in Telluride, Colorado, or Burlington, Vermont, your career is over, over even if no everyone walks away unharmed. Facing that constant fear of failure and grasping the elusive goal of perfection is what propels us to do more and more in life than we would ever imagine. Now, when we read this letter to Titus, Paul is asking Titus to do something remarkable. Push the envelope, Titus. I'm sending you there to straighten out things, finish what was left undone. Growing a church on Crete in that time was not easy. Paul says, don't fail and don't come home until you've left the church in the capable hands of godly men and women. Teach them the importance of character so that they will not only do things right, using Paul term, Paul's term for what is fit for sound doctrine in chapter 2, verse 1, but also doing the right things. And that's what we see here in this final chapter of the book, chapter 3. Last week, you remember, I mentioned that how we're to work on our character by focusing on upright, holy lives. Two weeks ago, I asked you to look at your ordinary life moments and pursue them as a liturgy for living, a life of maximum performance in godliness. So this week, our minds turn to chapter 3, where our purpose for living is explained with very high-density granularity. We're saved by God to do good things in the world. Not impossible things, good things. It should be a given that our faith in Jesus Christ should not interfere with our duty as citizens. And so we see in verse 1, it tells us to be subject to our rulers, obedient to our authorities. Being subject or submissive and being obedient are very similar terms here. One means to place ourselves in an orderly fashion. And the other term suggests a compliance to both human authority as well as to God. Too bad that, there, that there's no adjective that our submission should only be to good governments. That would really help so that we could obey whenever we like our government when it's good. And then we could be a stinker or a rabble rouser when our government is bad or evil. No, the verse was written at a period in history when there was a tremendous persecution of believers by local rulers as well as the global emperors. Paul says, teach them to be peaceable and ready to do what is good. That word peaceable is a wonderful word. It's developed from the word meaning that's called macho. Be a macho a strong, confident person who promotes peace. 
But don't be so macho or obstinate that you get mixed up in quarrels or agitation. Think cowboy like John Wayne rather than pirate Johnny Depp. If you miss everything else this morning, remember this. God pushed the envelope when he sent Jesus Christ to become our savior. God sent Jesus on a search and rescue mission for every last one of us. Here we were, disobedient to God's ways, living a selfish life, wasting our days in pleasure, feeling malice and jealousy for what we don't have, hating others and being hated. And then Jesus came. He broke the sound barrier of silence that had lasted for 400 years and he landed on a postage stamp sized barn in the stealth of night without any clearance from the Roman authority or even the tower, local tower of religious rabbis in Israel. All kinds of G forces were at work against this event. In verse four, it says, when the, God, when the goodness and the loving kindness of God our savior appeared, he saved us not because of our righteous deeds, but by his mercy. God's mercy envelope was pushed to its very limits. Why should God have an eternal heaven and a universe full of bright stars and marvelous natural wonders that's perfect and yet he has no one with whom to share it? Where would be the joy in that? How could God open up his glorious creation to every person to experience glorious eternity when there's no one righteous, only wayward and selfish sinners down here who mock him and deny his existence? Something had to change. God's plan had to change. And so he sent Jesus to be the sacrifice for all sin once and for all so that those who would believe in him to follow Christ would be welcomed forever into God's paradise park the believers would one day dine at the wedding supper of the lamb they would receive all new clothes i know you probably said i've got nothing to wear well guess what you'll have all new clothes for the wedding supper of the lamb they would witness the end of all suffering they would enjoy peace and eternity both with god and with the family of faith they would number in crowds so large that not even Google could count them. And in verse eight, Paul says, this is a trustworthy statement. And he insisted that people believe it. Those who have trusted or relied on God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. Doing good things is really doing God's things. And doing God's thing is profitable for everyone involved. He repeats this action again in verse 14. Repetition here is a reminder. Do good, do good, do good. You know, if the church would do good, the good that God called us and equipped us to do, there would be one universal response, joy. Now, let me tell you a short, a short story about joy. It's a great exclamation of delight that we all want to have. Centuries ago, when communication was solely limited to rare parchment and handwritten messages, medieval scribes would economize the space of their document by using shorthand whenever possible. Sometimes they would become so overwhelmed by the joy they had that they wrote the word in large shorthand letters at the end of a sentence. The Latin word for joy is I-O. They would write a large I over a smaller O. And over the years, that less prominent O shrank to a dot. And that is how we got an exclamation point in our language. Now, if you're watching this message on a recording, and whether or not you have faith or God, faith in God, I would think you'd be quite happy to see people doing good work in your community at no cost to you. Reducing crime, promoting healthy families, providing excellent medical care, 
volunteering to help the less fortunate, being peaceable and considerate in the marketplace, trustworthy with property, men and women whose word is their bond, who avoid stupid controversies, who reject factious people and have nothing to do with evil. To a large extent, that is the overarching theme of church history. Establishing hospitals, universities, literacy, agriculture and technology that would give you joy and that would give us joy too. Now just as it would be a waste of time, a waste to have expensive aircraft and not ever fly it to its capabilities, so also it would be a waste to have a body of believers who would never live dangerously to their designed capabilities and respond to the grace of God and the gift of salvation. You know, the angel Gabriel one morning said, God is going to do something new in you, Mary. He's pushing the envelope. But remember, nothing is impossible with God. Jesus Christ gave everything for you. The church now is the hope of the world. Let's all start wearing the suits God gave us, our God suits, our G suits, and let us breathe in that pure oxygen of God's Holy Spirit, igniting our hearts and perfecting our character as we become mature and pursue this ministry of doing good wherever, whenever, however we can, with God being our help. Verse 14 says, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Now, if you're gonna hang up the Christian armor in your prayer closet and take the first exit you see off the Christian's Life Adventure Highway, if you're gonna to neglect to finish what others have started, well then, my friend, you are missing some of the very best parts of life. Psalm 92 says, the righteous will flourish like the palm tree. Look around you. Verse 14 of Psalm 92 says, that they will yield fruit in old age. Do you like that? They will stay fresh and green, saying the Lord is upright, he is my rock and there's no wickedness in him. I told you in the beginning, in my mind, I imagine things to go perfectly. With God, I imagine things will go perfectly. In closing, let me say that the great misery in life is not that so many are dying. It is that so many are not really living. Flourish with us that we will finish well. Let us pray. Almighty God, again, as we come to you, even though we are advanced in years, our bodies have tremendous capabilities left. We know you're not asking us to do something that we physically can't do or mentally can't do. You're asking us to do things that we can do, whether it's being nice to our neighbor to help out wherever we can, to be available to your Holy Spirit, to say a good word for Jesus Christ, to do a good deed for a stranger, to entertain angels unawares. Lord God, may this day be an opportunity to show us all the things you have yet to do through us. We know that you're not finished with us yet. As long as we have breath, Almighty God, give us a chance, give us an opportunity to show that we are going to continue to flourish and be very fruitful and be very green, even in old age. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our concluding hymn is called, He Giveth More Grace. It's number 291. Sing with me. It's all about the power that we receive from God. We did not deserve it. It is by his grace. Sing with me. Oh
be available at outside here somewhere with a box to receive your offering today. And as you go your way, will you receive a benediction? May the Lord go with you. May he go before you to show you the way behind you to encourage you, above you to watch over you, and within you to give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you richly today. Thank you.